Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. So last year, what I consider to be the queer event of the summer was the queer craft festival that happened in Plainfield. And anyone who attended can tell you that the response was overwhelming. And there were people who were actually parking at the Goddard North, uh, the Goddard Greatwood campus and walking the length of Plainfield to get to the rec field to attend this. So to talk about what you can expect this year is Dana and Lee. So welcome. Hi, thanks for having us. Uh, th thank you for being here because you you've been doing a lot. And could we start a little bit about just talking about the vision for the Queer Craft Festival, how long you've been doing this, and the response from, from your previous events? Yeah, I'm going to let you take it since you had, were the one who had the idea in the first yeah. place. Yeah, well, I, I, um, I'm a, a potter and I've been selling at the Montpelier Farmer's Market and, and um, had just moved here a few years ago. And was just other places that I've lived before, there have been queer arts events and queer queer um, craft fairs and things where queer artists come together um, and are selling their work. And it just has a really different feeling than some of the, you know, slightly stuffier events that maybe sometimes happen in Vermont. And honestly, as a, as a like, also, as a sort of beginning artist, I was feeling a little bit intimidated by applying to those like juried events. Um, and I was like, you know what? I know so many artists around here. Like I already like I'm, I had moved here in 2021 and already in 2022. I was like, I know I know so many um, really amazing artists who are not thinking about selling their stuff at craft fairs. But like, what if we just got a bunch of us together and did a thing? And um, I said it enough times that. Some people connected me with some other folks in the community, including Dana, who um, who they thought might be interested in helping make that happen. Um, and the response was incredible. Like five of us came together um, to organize that first event in uh, December 2022. And the, the response was astonishing. It was like we put up an application and we thought, oh, cool, like maybe 10 of our friends or 15 of our friends will show up. And we had 60 applications in 10 days and we had to like shut the thing down and go, oh God, like wait list, maybe, I don't know. And we were thinking about being at the Grange, which is tiny, like a beautiful space, but also very small. And we had to like find a new venue. Um, and just suddenly we were organizing this larger event. And then, and and one of the folks who, who showed up at the beginning to organize. It's been the same crew, um, sort of rotating array of organizers, but the same core crew of five of us throughout. Um, and one of them in particular, Martin, who I know was on this show last year, I would say had all of us, but but it, in my mind, some, somewhat Martin in particular had this vision of like, this thing can be, this thing can be bigger. We can actually show the community like what a queer event means, like what it means to hold a space in a really beautiful way. And like, center queer people and center marginalized people um, and invite everybody in. Um, and they also, after that that event, which we had over a thousand people through the door and we all just sort of went, what in the world just <laughs> happened? <laughs> um, and then uh, Martin also had this vision to continue on into a summer event. Um, and uh, Dana, and Martin and another organizer, Harry, did last year's summer event. I was not actually part of organizing that one. Yeah. Um, 
yeah which is great we have a little like take a break when you need to and come back in on the yeah. organizing um yeah i think for the summer festival that it's still a, a work in progress of of what it is but i think we're really uh the winter one is like a true sort of craft fair it's the holidays people are buying gifts and the summer festival is really more about that like expansive rural vermont summer feeling um so it's crafts but it's also performances and it's also a ton of food vendors and lounging by the river and playing on the playground with your kids and seeing your friends and chatting in this more like big village um, way and really connecting with the outdoor space and the natural space um, martin as lee mentioned one of our organizers is also a farmer and um, there's queerness to be found in not just the things that humans make, but the world around us and the world we inhabit. So I think that's part of the vibe of yeah. the summer festival is tapping into this beautiful place that we live in and what it means to be queer folks in a rural space, which is really different than a super urban place. And, and, well, and I misidentified you as the queer craft festival it should have been the queer arts festival and it because... is the queer craft fair in winter so we have two <laughs> names for each of the two events yeah you're you're just trying to confuse us old queens and okay so <laughs> yeah, yeah. the the intent of this core group is that you are going there will be two events each year one occurring with the so the winter solstice Mm -hmm. and one happening after the summer solstice mm -hmm. and depending upon the season and everything happening around it that will dictate the breadth of the festival or sort of how focused it becomes yeah yeah and i think also we are five people who have various experiences organizing things and events but this is all of our first go-round organizing a craft fair or an arts festival and I think we all have a pretty um like don't be surprised if it continues to evolve and change because we have a lot of ideas about what it could be um and also we know that like people are really excited about what we've already sort of made. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're sort of we're we're in this process of of like what else can we do? What else can we bring in? What other like magic um can we bring? And I think a lot of it is also driven by what do the community members want to bring to it? Like it really we want this to be the community's event and the community's festival, and we are facilitating that and guiding it and making sure it's inclusive and accessible and all of that. But I have a friend who's like, what if we had queer friend speed dating? What if we had a, a meetup for fiber artists? What if we, could I come and sing? Could I come and perform this? So like, yes, I want to say yes to all those people in as much as we are able to facilitate and support that. So the festival is also driven by what do people want to bring to it? Yep. Well, looking at the notice that I put out saying, okay, we're looking for vendors. You know, what is it that I have to offer that could contribute to this incredible festival. And let me say right up front, you know, Lee, you're saying, oh, this was sort of a first time effort for us. Oh my God, you hit it out of the ballpark <laughs> first time effort. Oh, please. Because looking at it, you're looking for, you know, performances that will happen on and off during the day, different types of art exhibits. There's a reference to different space that will take you to different portals and sort of different realities. Could could you talk a little bit about some of those performances that you're hoping are going to happen? And I really want to hear about the artworks and being transported. Mm -hmm. You want to do it? Yeah, I can take a stab yeah. at that. I think, um, so we had our we had our vendor application that that was open and has since closed and that's just more sort of strictly for like I want to put up a booth and sell my artworks right that's the application I filled out um and and that has already happened and I, the second thing that you're that you're talking about is this this like invitation that we tried to put out to say what like what else can people bring to us? What else can, what else is out there that we can, that we can have happen at the festival? And 
Um, I'm getting a little bit lost in my train of thought. So Dana, will yeah. you pick up for a second? Yeah, I think <laughs> totally. I love that you latched onto the portals um, word. Yeah. I think that's something that we've been talking about for a while since since winter. Winter is sort of the like dreaming time for summer, right? Um, and Lee and I actually both took a little break in the winter. So the folks who really were dreaming the portal are not the ones you get to talk to today. That's okay. <laughs> we get to carry forward each other's vision. But um, I think part of what we're trying to do with all of our events is a little bit imagine the queer future that we want to live in. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of events of queer folks gathering that's about protesting all of the bad things that are happening right now. And we are more about like, what if we focused on the joy and what if we focused on the great things about being queer and what do we want to have happen in the future world that we're dreaming into and the future world may not be perfect it may be collapse of civilization it may be the end of capitalism it may be a lot of really hard things but um we think that queer folks are sort of uniquely situated to be able to dream a little into the world that we want to see so we i think took that idea of like what would happen if entering this festival was just stepping through a portal into the joyful queer future like what would that look like mm -hmm. um and so that's sort of the prompt that we're asking artists to engage with who want to work on some installation pieces to be throughout the festival and part of this is we like feel really good about how we support folks who make handicrafts who can mm -hmm. sell things great we love that we've given them a space and there are a lot of creative people in our community who are like i don't make stuff to sell i make other kinds of things mm -hmm. um and this is a way to really showcase those people and their talents too and we've gotten some cool applications so far yeah. for like installation art we've and i can't even really... tell you what it's gonna be but it's yeah gonna be super neat it's gonna i'm really excited to sort of see to see it come to fruition and, and come come through into the world and so and i think you'll just have to come to the festival and see see what shows up and and i say that 100% not because I'm trying to keep it because we're trying to sort of keep anything mysterious and a secret but, but because it is entirely mysterious to all of us at this point um what people will show up with and I think it's going to be really beautiful okay so also if if I understood the promotion narrative correctly there are musicians who will be performing throughout the day it's not just going to be a sort of stagnant oh a concert but they will be sort of alternating performances here and there throughout the day. Is that also going to include some dance pieces, maybe a little bit of theater, like between the willows that's forming in Essex Junction? Oh, I don't know about that. And after the interview, we'll talk. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, yeah. So we, Last year, we had a performance stage on one side of the festival, and that was sort of going on on throughout the day. Um, and one thing that we're trying this year in the interest of both allowing um, people who are vending to sort of participate more in the art and sort of having this like having a, a communal moment in the festival that's not commerce focused is we are actually going to have um, a performance hour in the center of the festival where vending will not be happening um and uh and we will have there will be a dance performance which the people at uh, some of the folks from rivers way dance studio are dreaming up um there will be we have a lot of i i don't know exactly how it's going to come together but um i think it's going to be really exciting and pretty beautiful way to sort of like bring us all into the space um, together. And then we also are hoping for some performances throughout the day to sort of activate different parts of the festival and have some, um, like Dana said, other kinds of arts yeah, going on. And hopefully a little more integrated. So you might see a few craft vendors and you might see some installation art and then you might walk by a stage where someone's playing the piano and like rather than performance over here, craft vendors over here, yes. it's more like intermixed mm -hmm. village of folks. Well, this is really wonderful. You know, because I can I can just sort of walk through, you know, the rec field, the open field, and what I'm going to experience is going to vary according to just my walking through the meadow, which is great. Now, if, if I heard you correctly, and I had one person already ask me, there will be snacks there, right? Yes. You, yes. you did say that there yeah. would be food vendors. There will be food vendors. We are... Um... Yeah, that is the, we we are 
trying to make sure that we have enough food vendors that people will have lunch whenever they want it throughout the day and also people vending snacks. Um, we always have snacks available for, for uh, vendors and volunteers, but we want everybody yeah. attending the festival to be able to, you know, purchase food from one of our really delightful, mostly queer food vendors um, and picnic by the river or. Yeah. The and field. that, and that is a thing that we have lacked in past events or had just a few food vendors and they have sold completely out. Yes. So we really have put more focus this year on making sure we have enough people to feed the people. So, yeah. And there are some really, I mean, yeah, there are some really amazing queer, the, we union brook farm who um are a couple of lesbian poultry and pork farmers in northfield they're going to be there um fox market is going to be there i don't know who else but i am excited about a number of them so if, if i'm hearing you correctly and and it's probably one of my presumptions to start with your emphasis in putting this all together was to create a form for queer vendors and artists and craftspeople and food vendors. So mm -hmm. it is reaching out to our communities and bringing all of our communities to together so mm -hmm. that we can share the gifts that we have. Totally. Absolutely. And we also, um, like Lee was saying, our first process involved opening an application forum, uh, freaking out when we had 50 or 60 people <laughs> a week later and closing it. Um, and since then, we put <laughs> more thought into the application We've process. modified our process. Yeah, okay. um, and at this point, we are getting almost double the amount of applicants that we have space for, uh, which is more than double, more than double, yeah. which is a bummer for the people who don't get accepted, but shows something about the level of interest. Yeah. And we really, with those people, we like want to do some intentional um, sorting and not just either pick the people who are fastest at filling out a form or randomly pick them um, or pick the people whose art we particularly think is nice which is how many craft fairs yeah. do a juried sort of thing yeah um so we prioritize folks of color who are queer we prioritize elders we prioritize youth um and we give some extra weighting in our lottery to folks who have a disability is that mm -hmm. one thing we did this year yep um yeah. folks who like yeah so some of these categories where like we are aware that we all hold multiple identities and those affect how we move in the world and um, getting the opportunity to be at a fair like this may mean an extra lot for a queer youth who maybe doesn't have as much support from their family or from BIPOC folks who may not have access to intergenerational wealth in the same way. So um, it's a little bit of an unusual way to pick people the way like traditional craft fairs are like once you're in, you're in forever and ever and every single time. And I think some vendors have been a little bemused by the way we're doing it, but it really is in the interest of um, equity and uh, having lots of folks represented who aren't always represented in craft spaces. Yeah, and sort of making sure that people from all of the corners of the queer community in in Vermont and in Central Vermont and in this region are are represented, not just the folks from sort of the center of the queer community who might be, you know, white thirty something queers like me and Dana. <laughs> I I wasn't going to comment on that, but. <laughs> So if if I'm a vendor and I don't make it for the summer festival, there's a good chance I might make it for the winter festival. And with that, we've used up our time. Mm -hmm. I know, isn't it amazing? That's so, cool. so I'm I'm looking forward to August 17th, Wreckfield in Plainfield. So thank you and good luck. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm here with Jillian Espina, who is a Filipino lesbian born and raised in the Bay Area. She's currently attending California State University at Northridge, majoring in Deaf Studies with a double major in Asian American Studies and Queer Studies. Very impressive. Um, with passion. She aspires to build a bridge between minority communities by addressing intersectionality in the academic and professional field. Welcome, Jillian. Thank you for having me. Um, I just wanted to say it's a double minor. I'm double minoring in those two. Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I was, you are absolutely right. Thank you. Yeah, because Jeff studies major, 
double minor, of course, of course, thank you. Um, we met and you interviewed me and now I'm interviewing you. So we have a little reciprocity. Yes. Um, I'll tell you my end of it. I, I subscribe to Sinister Wisdom and they have a Sinister Wisdom snapshot that they, you know, publish bi-weekly. And in it, I saw a call for interviewees of pioneers. Uh, and I thought it was through Curve magazine, but apparently not. Um, how did you happen to interview me? What happened on your end? Well, um, at CSUN, Cal State University of Northridge, I took a queer studies class called LA in Transit, which basic basically goes over um, all the different movements that happened within the queer community in specifically California. Um, because most of the time when we talk about queer history, um, the East Coast gets a lot of attention and people tend to forget that, you know, it was a movement that happened everywhere. And so um, a part of that class was kind of like acknowledging the people that have come before you, because I wasn't able to take, you know, a queer studies class without all the progress that happened uh, prior. And so um, one of the assignments was to interview a gay elder. And so um, I met you through the June Mazur Lesbian Archives, and that's how we ended up meeting. And uh, if I just may add, there was a wonderful end of semester presentation that the elders were invited to join. And you and your classmates presented sort of gifts honoring the people you interviewed. And it was so impressive and so creative. And your gift to me was very, um, very meaningful and smart and creative. So thank you for that. Thank uh, you. I have to tell, uh, commend your teacher. It's, I think it's a great assignment, sort of bringing everybody out of the classroom and into the communities, which I think is really movement building and smart. Um, Let's talk about the class for a minute. What were your favorite parts of it? Um, what readings or projects did you particularly respond to and why? Uh, I definitely love doing the interview because I got to meet you. It was fun, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's nice talking to people and getting personal experiences because I think just talking about it, it gives you a different feel as opposed to reading it on a page. I definitely did appreciate, you know, the reading. One of the um, books we had to read was Baby, You Are My Religion, written by my professor, Dr. Marie Cartier. And it had a bunch of like short biographies of different people she interviewed, all from different backgrounds um, and different time periods, but they all identified, you know, within the queer community. And that was very interesting to like hear some like short like stories about the people that lived through, you know, the, the 50s, the 60s, 70s, and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, I see you identify as a lesbian as opposed to other descriptors like queer. Why lesbian? Would you mind telling us? Of course. Um, the term, the label lesbian didn't feel like me for a long time because I didn't really... I didn't think it was me. I mean, I grew up not knowing any lesbians and there wasn't a lot of lesbian representation, like quite frankly, anywhere. And even if there is, it's very minimal. So it's it's hard for me to see myself in that. And I guess, um, I, not I guess, I know that as I grew older, I had more access to resources like the internet and things like that, you know, meeting people um, and just get really getting up out there. I had the ability to research and see um, labels that felt like me and queer never really felt like me but lesbian did. And it's just knowing, you know, how um, the important role that they play like in the feminist movement and just, you know, wh what they did in um, during the AIDS epidemic, just like things like that. It's really, it, it helped me find like pride in that label. Like not only do I um, identify with it, but I'm proud to have it. You didn't go through a bisexual moment like many of us did. I I did. I did actually, because uh, growing up, I grew up like Catholic and um, I was always open to the idea of, you know, like dating someone of the same gender. But I didn't realize that that wasn't just a preference. It's kind of the only not the only thing, but just like avoidance from men was really more so what my identity was, as opposed to liking both. Um, when you came out, did you face any obstacles? I, when I originally came out as bisexual, um, I was, I came out to my family. My sister already knew. I can't remember. I think I told her like maybe, 
not of an entire year before I had uh, come out to my parents, but definitely like a couple of months. So she already knew. Um, and it was so casual. Like I, I remember I was like eating a hot dog and then we were talking about something and I was like, oh yeah, talking about liking girls. And she was like, did you just come out to me? And I was like, I guess I did. And I think I wasn't like overthinking it or anything. And so it just like came out and she was like, oh, like, you know, thank you for telling me, like, I love you. And then I came out to my parents because I was a little bit older and I was like, my sister knows, I feel like they should know, like, it's a, it's a part of who I am. And I think it's important. And so I told them and obviously, you know, they were really accepting. It, it's really scary because you never know how your parents are going to react. Like I was talking to my mom about it last night and she was saying like, it's so we were we were watching um a show I don't know what the uh who it's under but we're watching like we're here which like focuses on like drag queens visiting different like cities and different states and like you know introducing drag to people in the queer community and things and allies and so the topic of coming out was being talked about my mom was like did you really have no idea that you know we were going to be accepting like she's like that like I feel so sad to like know that maybe I could have made you feel a certain way and I was saying no, like, I mean, yeah, part of me knew that you were going to accept me, but you never know until it actually happens, you know, because it's like a terrifying thing. There's all these thoughts going through your head. You're really young. And so, you know, that whole thing. <laughs> Did you come out as bisexual or lesbian right away? I came, yeah, when I came out to my parents, I came out as bisexual. And then a couple years later, probably <laughs> two years specifically, then I was like, no, I, I'm a lesbian. So you have a sister who is older. Yes, that's correct. And she was the first person. What about friends? My friends? Hmm. Actually, I knew that, uh, I know in middle school, um, I had gay friends. And I don't know. That's kind of, I think we all kind of just knew, which is really weird. We never like went out and we're like, hey, I'm gay. Like, it's just for some reason, like word got around and we just all knew. And then we like found each other and then we just like hung out. And so they knew. I would say, yeah, they knew before my sister because I told my sister around like late middle school, more towards high school. Um, and my middle school friends, we all knew in middle school. So I guess they knew before. Did you have a GSA or anything in your schools in middle school and high school? No, I <laughs> think I know we had a uh, an LGBTQ plus club in high school. Um, so even though I did attend Catholic schooling in middle school and high school, middle school, we didn't have anything there, uh, but high school, we had a queer club. And did you go? I did. I did attend the, uh, it was called the Rose Club, but they always met during lunch. And I kind of, I had this thing where I didn't want people to like see me eating and like talk, like it just felt like awkward. And so I went like once, like to feel it out. And I was like, yeah, this is really awkward. <laughs> so I didn't uh -huh. go. <laughs> yeah. Um. Can we go back to your relationship to Catholicism? As you know, I was raised Catholic too and went to Catholic schools up through the end of high school. Um, I had kind of a vexed relationship, uh, although I hadn't come out yet. But so how do you, um, you're still a practicing Catholic and um, you're negotiating some of the doctrinal differences, I imagine. How, tell us how that works. Well, I would say growing up, it was a huge part of me because Catholicism is a huge part of Filipino culture. And, you know, my parents immigrated from the Philippines and they decided to raise me with English. And so the language is something that I was culturally deprived of. My parents didn't mean to do that. That just happened. Sure. Um, so, you know, besides like the food and like the moral and like cultural values of like the importance of family, um, religion was a huge part for me. And so I really young, I had this whole life path, you know, to go through all the sacraments, you know, get married in a church, marry a man, like all these things I thought, you know, because it was like set up for me already. You know, it sure. was all it was all there in front of me laid out. So it's like all I have to do is follow it. It can't be hard. I didn't know. <laughs> but then I grew up. I realized, you know, like as I got older and got I progressively like more gay, like understanding my identity, I was like, oh, OK, so I don't think I can marry a man. I don't think I can get married in church. Um, And I would go to school. There was an assignment at school where like we had to read on different Catholic viewpoints of the queer community. And oh, really? that was interesting. Yes. Yes. That was really like hard for me because I always knew that you know, the Catholic Church isn't the most welcoming when it comes to the queer community. Like every, there's obviously a whole bunch of different opinions. Like me personally, I practice my faith in a way that's like just me because I don't follow everything that the Catholic Church teaches because I 
like I believe you know we're all just people I don't think it's fair to say it's not a sin to be gay but if you act on it it is you know like I I don't believe in that um and so read like reading that was really shocking to me because it's like I never experienced like any form of like bullying or like you know um like homophobia I never experienced that but just reading it really hurt and that made it a lot more difficult to come to terms with me being a lesbian because one of the reasons the label felt so foreign was because it was just something I didn't know about and it felt scary because it's like okay I can accept that I like women but it's hard to accept that I don't like men like that was the hardest part for me because it's like oh now I have to completely detach from this like idea that I had for myself growing up and so that was just a really hard thing to process and go through but then once I got past that it's like okay you know what it's my decision to continue to be in touch with my faith in my own way I believe religion is something that's so personal and I don't think anyone should be able to define that for you and if it's like you know your individual decision to detach with your religion that's okay it's a personal thing if you want to keep going that's okay too I just I am really grateful to have like a supportive uh, family and you know have a good support system within my friends as well to know that I can continue like being the same person essentially and following, you know, the same things I've always followed growing up because my parents have always been accepting. And so that's been nice. And there's a Catholic organization called Dignity. Do you know about it? No, I don't, I, I don't think so. Yeah, it's a LGBTQ Catholic organization. Um, I tried to go to one of their meetings once and I couldn't, I sort of began to differ in high school because of reproductive rights. and Yes a woman you know so it's a problematic mm -hmm. faith but good for you for working it through i applaud that yeah. um, so let's switch to deaf studies why did you happen to major in deaf studies i think it's great thank you <laughs> um i started learning american sign language in high school because we had to take a language other than an english course and I thought that, you know, the um, communication um, s using your hands, I found that very interesting because um, it's visual. And I've always been very, like, observant. I I don't know why. Just growing up, I've been very, like, eager um, to, like, eager with my eyes, if that makes sense. I was kind of, like, quiet. So it's it's less, like going out there and talking and it's more so like being still and like watching and because of that I noticed um interpreters and like assemblies and things like that and they always caught my attention I was like wow that's very interesting you know I never really met anyone or like new people um that signed themselves and so I was like I have the opportunity to learn American Sign Language in high school why not and so I did I fell in love with the language um I found out you know there's a whole culture that comes with being deaf all things like that. And I was like, yeah, it'd be really nice to um, pursue a career where I can use this language. Um, and I decided to major in deaf studies. Are there different kinds? We sort of, uh, when we talked earlier, there were different, there's like Latino ASL, or can you talk a little about the different pursuits you can go after if you're studying ASL? Yes, of course. Um, it's a really common misconception that American Sign Language is like the only form of sign language. American Sign Language is not a universal language. It's used predominantly here in America. So there are a whole bunch of other forms of sign language, um, depending on, you know, where you are located on the planet. For example, there's Mexican Sign Language in Mexico. There's Filipino Sign Language in the Philippines. And, you know, even in the same country, there are different variations because I know um, some signs in Northern California are more commonly used um, than in Southern California and we're in the same state. So it's really, it's it's very, it is, it can be a bit confusing, but the most like um, important thing to know if you are interested like in learning or picking up sign language is just to really get out there and kind of see what the people around you are using, see the signs they're using. And you kind of just have to like keep that in the back of your mind um, so that you can like see um, and kind of like adjust to what they're using, yeah. Oh, so you, it's not like you have to learn whole different languages. Well, I guess it is whole different it, yeah. languages depending on where you are. Yeah, yeah. Um, they they say they're like just like variations of American Sign Language. Like 
there are so many, um, not so many, but some signs can mean one thing in one place and then mean something else in another. I mean, American Sign Language is, it's like, it's one language, but there are like, sometimes people would call them like accents because if you're like in like Texas, the signs they use there would be like a little bit different than the signs they use here. Like it would be known without, uh, within the country, but one sign, oh, people are like, oh, actually I use two hands for this or something like that. Yeah. They're pretty interesting. Do you find they daunting? or challenging <laughs> actually yeah that that when you when you say it like that <laughs> it can mm -hmm. be i'd say um but i i think people kind of like historically um from what i've learned in class and everything like that um the the deaf community just has like had um a lot of struggles with like um language deprivation and just not you know not knowing how big the community might be too because if you have um if you're all separated, it's really difficult, you know, to come together and things like that. And so they kind of had to, um, I guess it's a, it's a really, uh, it, how do I say this? It's kind of hard. To, it's kind of difficult to explain. Um, you really want, communication is very important um, within the deaf community and um, within the sign language um, language, you know, communication is, is key. And so it's never, you never, um, go up to or you never like face the uh, conversation or something like that and feel like oh like feel like a burden and you don't want to like say that you don't understand something because you know the whole point is to like hey I'm trying to say something and I want you to know and then you're trying to say something and I want to know and so it can be very like uh, scary to um, use a language that you're not fluent in which everyone you know that's that's for any language um, but specifically with sign languages knowing that deaf people usually grow up with language deprivation they want to make sure that you're understanding them and that you're understanding um you know everything and so that knowing that like in the back of my mind helps because it's like oh i didn't catch what you signed can you like sign that again they're always like yeah you know totally because if they don't understand something they're gonna say hey i don't understand what you signed could you sign it again maybe try it in another another way and i think that's like beautiful and that's really it's really nice you know to know that yeah that's really challenging it it is, but um, it's very interesting to me. So, it's it's lovely. Um, how do you plan to build bridges by addressing intersectionality academically and professionally? This is directly from your bio. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, well, I decided to double minor in Asian American studies and queer studies because I identify with those two communities. And growing up, um, like high school, middle school, you don't really get to learn about them very much. Um, in America, at least it's all like focused on, you know, like the history of America and all the people that like came here. And, you know, that that history is very catered towards a small group of people. And so I think it's nice for me to learn about my community so that when I do have the opportunity to work with those um, in the deaf community, I can support them on levels that we relate to. I definitely think, you know, being a lesbian and being a person of color, I can have that form of connection with other deaf individuals that they may not have with other um, deaf individuals that don't that aren't this, of the same race and that aren't, you know, um, within the LGBTQ plus community. And so um, I think that can really help because intersectionality is something that is very real. We all carry several labels. You're never just one thing. You kind of deal with different forms of oppression at the same time it's not something you don't get to choose to be okay today i'm going to be a woman and then you just get treated like a woman you know you're all of these things all the time all at once and i think you know learning about that can really help because it's like i have my lived experiences but also knowing the history and like how it's been written into law it's so important and i think it can better support the deaf community and um you know kind of create community um by learning about those things do you have particular projects that you're interested in um, besides school and working? <laughs> um, besides trying to get my driver's license. You know, <laughs> That's a good project. <laughs> um, I'm really just, I guess I'm really just trying to hone in on these like last two years I have in college, really like take advantage of the classes and things like that. So I haven't been thinking very ahead, which I know stresses some people out. Me, I just try and get it through one day at a time. So that's how it is right now. <laughs> I remember when I was a senior in college, I went to a tea and, we, you know, some friends and I were standing there when the professor said, well, what are you going to do after college? And, you know, we were like weeks away. And one by one, we said, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. 
you know. So there are different approaches. And I think a lot of times maybe uh, you'll disagree with me about that. People are so structured and driven that you miss a lot. But maybe that's just my uh, approach to things. No, but, I, see, I see that point of view. I see are you going to go to graduate? Now, now I'll just fall into the trap. Are you going to go to graduate school or don't you know? It's early. I, You're junior, right? I'm a, yeah, I'll be a junior in the fall. I don't know. I wouldn't say yes, but I also wouldn't say no. It's more like, you know, I'm open to it. We'll see if that's where it goes kind of thing. That, that makes perfect sense. Um, I took time between my degrees and yeah, I found it very useful. You appreciate it more and you, you do fall out of practice. But you can snap back into it pretty easily. Yeah. So Jillian, what final words would you like to leave our audience with? Um, I love the saying queer joy is resistance. I think that is beautiful. I think of what? queer joy is resistance. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. I, I'm actually a part of this club at my school, Queer Students of Color. And our like president said that, said that quote. And I'm like, I've heard it before, but just hearing you say it now, it's just so amazing. It's, I wholeheartedly believe in it. It's so genuine. Like, just knowing that our community has come this far is amazing. But, you know, of course, there's still so much progress that needs to be made. I think it's great that we acknowledge the people that have come before us, all the the things that you have done, <laughs> the the movements and everything like that. It's, it's awesome, but we got to keep going, keep working towards that, you know, just having pride in my label and seeing what I can do for my local community, I think will definitely help, you know, the future and, and things like that. Well, you know, I'm reading a lot about Sarah Schulman, one of my idols, and she has a line, everybody keeps telling us how much progress we've, we've made, but that doesn't mean it's over, you know, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean we still don't have work to do. So it sounds like uh, you're ready for the, for La Lucha, I don't know, um, and that you bring a lot of enthusiasm and creativity and gifts to the work, so Julian, thank you and best of luck in the future and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist.